Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for an awesome More Insights and Strategy podcast here. I am joined by the quantum famous IBM fellow, VP of IBM Quantum, Dr. Jay Gambetta. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And it is big announcement day here at, at IBM. And I just really appreciate uh, you uh, coming on the show here. So first off, there's a lot of talk about quantum centric supercomputing. And I've heard kind of variations of that term. But can you talk about what it is and what it will actually do? Yeah, so uh, today at the IBM Quantum Summit, where um we're releasing this, uh, we're releasing our vision for the future. And so, and we'll talk later about all the wonderful things we've done. But what I see happening is the future of quantum computing has to be something different. It's something different to what we've done before. Before, And we're calling this quantum centric supercomputing. And essentially what I see in it is we need to solve three fundamental things to make this, this future of larger quantum computers available. The first is we really have to focus on how we bring modularity to quantum. So how do we make multiple chips or multiple fridges or solve the electronics and even modularity in the software? The second is communication and computation, which we traditionally thought were different fields, are going to come together much like they did in classical computing to allow us to communicate data between different processes. So how does quantum communication and computation come together? And how does that architecture? And the third, which I am really excited by, is how do we get the middleware for quantum? How do we get quantum and classical working together so it seamlessly integrates workflows that can take the best of classical and quantum and really enable that quantum, that quantum to be the accelerator in a larger heterogeneous computing architecture? So if I was to say three things of what quantum-centric supercomputing is, is how do we bring modularity to quantum? How do we bring communication and computation together? And how do we enable the middleware for quantum computing? Well, and and net net, this is all about getting us closer to commercialization and solving these big hairy problems that that we talk about in ways that quite frankly no other technology will enable in in classical computing. So. I'm sure you didn't just, you know, we're not here, right? We're not, we haven't arrived with quantum centric supercomputing. There's a, a ton of exploration and research that needs to go into that. I'm curious if you can be, we can be specific. What were some of the research questions that need to be solved um, to enable quantum centric supercomputing? Yeah, so we, we'll, we'll outline a few of them. If I, go into the modularity uh, for quantum. Today, the electronics and all the things that make those processes together, we as a community are focused just on first of a kind. Now we need to focus on pushing the limit, so still doing first of a kind, but also how do we bring down the footprint? How do we bring down the cost? How do we make it so we can swap it out? Um, one of the things that we showed today was we showed that we've even started to investigate cold CMOS to control our qubits. So imagine the future of researching what it means to control these systems. How do we bring even CMOS and computing together? And then from the from the sort of application or architecture, uh, sorry, algorithm side, how do we write libraries and, and develop the way that I can split a problem from some large problem into smaller problems and then run many of them in parallel to bring parallelization to quantum computing so that I can bring those results back and, and then sum them back up to get an answer for the user. So how do we do what he had to do in classical and bring parallelization in so that ultimately the user's work can run faster? And then ultimately, how do we actually come up with these larger problems that we all want to solve and take the best of quantum and classical? No, I love it. Um, and listen, um, IBM Quantum is on a roll um, on a lot of different vectors. I mean, first off, years ago, you put out this very aggressive roadmap. And first off, anybody anybody applying a roadmap to something that's that future out, I have to you know give the, the golf clap to, because very rarely does that happen. 
I mean, maybe it's, hey, 10 years from now, 15 years now, and nobody will be held accountable. But, but to your credit, you actually state, you put out a roadmap and you stayed to it. And so far, all you've done is, is, is accelerated that. So I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that, that you're going to get there. Okay. So that's why I'm going to very quickly move into the target user for quantum centric uh, supercomputing. Like, like who is it? Is it different from, you know, the, um, the definition of supercomputing has evolved, right? From these giant national labs to now pharmaceutical companies, energy companies, all of these different, essentially where they need this incredible amount of compute power. Are these the same users supercomputing versus quantum centric supercomputers? Yeah, ideally we hope so. So what we are hoping to do is to focus on uh, and two of the other announcements we make a, made at the summit was we showed how we could take um, error mitigation and error suppression and incorporate them into an API so that the users no longer have to have to worry about the noise of these devices. So now we've got this level with, and as we go into this quantum centric supercomputer, where we need to go from the, the physics of quant the physicists that were studying it to these computer scientists, as you described, that can either be working at these large companies or these labs, but they really want to just work out how to grab that acceleration through quantum computing and apply it. They don't want to get lost in the weeds of the noise on the system or characterizing the devices. Yes, we still need to do that and work out how to make it better and better, but we need to get that abstraction layer up so that we can really ask, how is this going to integrate like uh, supercomputing. So I see the same type of users that really need computation as their differentiator, but we want to get to a level where we bring the software, the architecture to their level, rather than asking them to come down and learn about the physics of these devices. So a big part of this for us is the uh, one of the things I'm most excited about is since 2016, when we put the first API up, this is the first time we're really changing how people use these machines. Right. And we really want to see if this funnel uh, increases because we've simplified and we've taken it to a next abstraction level. Yeah, so my confidence level is raising every time you talk about this. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is this a similar um, progression that the industry made with with GPUs in, in how it evolved, or is it just completely different than that? I personally think the GPU analogy is one that we should try our best to follow in, uh, in, in thinking. Like I think the early uses of the GPUs were dominated by really low algorithmic work. And then we started to get um, libraries and now applications and now GPUs are <laughs> everywhere. I think with quantum centric, we'll start to, with this idea of bring the middleware in the quantum centric, we'll start to get those libraries next. Those libraries could be some of the, we're going to release a first alpha version we call circuit knitting, but it's only one of many. But those libraries will be the, the building blocks for the future applications. And as we develop and see many of these libraries um, that many other people, or you can even imagine other um, companies or other industries integrating into our stack to make to even extend more what can be done. I think you're going to see this this industry start to even get hopefully um, bigger with uh, pushing the limits of what can be done. Yeah, I'm sure there's a correlation between kind of a direct relationship between the ease of programmability and the the more people who get to use it. I mean, even on GPUs, there were people who are programming close to the metal, but there weren't too many people who actually were able to do that. And in quantum, it's even harder uh, because you're getting into the fidelity of qubits, you're getting a number of qubits, you're getting into scalability, uh, similarities, but uh, but some differences too. And, and I, I do think that's a, a positive thing. So um, you have different numbered, let's get into this uh, specific IBM quantum system. Okay. So uh, system one, uh, their system two, uh, what, it, what comes after system two? I mean, I don't need all the details. Uh, we're not a rumor show here, but, but what can you disclose on the show? Here? So first, uh, I, I would say system two 
doesn't exist yet. <laughs> so we're, we're pretty excited about it and we'll show an update of uh, System 2 and our goal is to make it turned on and showing at the end of 2023. Um, but in my view, if we've done System 2 right and we've um, engineered into the design modularity, I'm hoping that it can scale to really, really, really large numbers of qubits. So will there be a System 3? Only time will tell. But I think within System 2, rather than being a single system, which to me still was a great innovation we did, taking the lab to a central, a single system that we could deploy reliably in the cloud and in many different locations, we're now taking it to a single system that's modular in nature so that we can continuously upgrade it as we make improvements in making the chips bigger, adding communication, adding new electronics. So. I'm not sure if there's going to be a system three. Hopefully, if we've done everything right, we can scale this out to larger and larger uh, devices. I will say that some point in the future, and this is me um, guessing very far out, we're going to need to have like a quantum intranet connected between systems. So maybe when we put all those pieces together, that that defines a, a future looking system three. But let's let's leave that to the future future discussion. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but you know, I'm pretty pretty excited about uh, these things. And it's funny that the way sometimes we talk about, you know, there being a system afterwards. It, there is going to be innovation. It's not like we've arrived and and we're done. But it it doesn't necessarily look like other types of systems in in how they in how they progress. You know, in my head, kind of system one, system two versus you know system n is not about uh, innovation continuing. It's more about an architecture that can scale yes. uh, in, in the ways that the industry uh, needs to do that. And I need to be sure when I'm educating everybody in the outside world, I don't, uh, you know, I'm trying to educate people that, hey, when Jay says he doesn't know if there's going to be a system three, <laughs> don't, don't take that as there won't be a lot more uh, uh, innovation uh, down the line. Yeah, there'll be, you are 100% 100% right. If we do it correctly, hopefully we can integrate continuous upgrading to make system two get more and more powerful. And I look at system two as the building block that makes this quantum centric architecture we described before what's possible. So um, how do clients engage with quantum centric supercomputing? Is it the same way that that they did when you first uh, kicked off the program or is it is it is it different? So it will be very similar. So it will, if we, we are designing it so that it can be a, as a service, so the computational node will be basically still, still executable. But we are changing the APIs and we are introducing a runtime environment that's much closer to the, uh, to the, to the central uh, QPU so we can run things faster. But we're also creating, as I discussed before, this middleware, which will show an alpha right. version of it, where you can now imagine I as a user, if I want to run part of my classical workflow on, say, some cloud, be it IBM cloud or another cloud, we want to write it in a way that you can. Or if you've got HPC on prem, you should just be able to use the best of that. So I see it more as the user will lift up a level and they will start to um, just think of quantum as sending the sending executables to the quantum, but then also in a very distributed way, sending to whatever is best for their cloud cloud resources. So I'm hoping we see the um, abstraction <laughs> level of how would they consume it change. Today, they will still get them either through the computational centers that we are um, working with many of our partners around the world, or through our um, through our data center that we have in Poughkeepsie. But you can now imagine even asking the question, do I take one of these systems and put it close to specialized classical computing so I can mix a combination of on-prem, cloud, classical, multi-cloud, all these different flexibilities will be at your hands for you to be able to uh, explore what is the best workflow for how you do it. And I'm hoping we can do it in a way where as classical computing makes progress, we want quantum just to fit in, not feel like it's like feel like it's different. We want it to feel different in what it can do, but not different in how to use it. 
Yeah, it's one surefire way to slow everything down is to recreate everything. And uh, if there's some proximity of, of the way that people uh, have worked in the past, it just makes that learning curve uh, even smaller. And so, Jay, we talked a lot about um, how clients and at least the way that I was interpreting it, uh, how they're using it to develop their own applications. But as we've seen in all growing markets, when you get into SaaS and services that actually use this capability, uh, that's when you really get in, like anybody can use this, right? They're just, they don't even have to know quantum. They're just using the application, but it's just better. When do you see this, this happening? Yeah, so I'm so excited by today. Uh, what we're showing with a few of our partners is they're actually taking their software code, be it they've developed in chemistry or in some type of op op uh, optimization, and they're starting to show these application integrations that are actually integrating with our core fundamental service because now we've moved to this middleware distributed sort of multi-cloud environment. And so I think we're going to start to see these third-party uh, software vendors that uh, that have always existed, like you install your software, they can start to now integrate it. So one of the things I, I'm predicting will happen in the near future is we'll get this application service integration APIs that will come out. I'm not 100% um, which ones will be first, whether it's in uh, chemistry or optimization, but we've put those frameworks together and now we've started to collaborate with uh, multiple different uh, industry partners to actually start, and they're going to show they're going to show later today how their software can seamlessly integrate with our um, with our Qiskit runtime as a service, and that combined with the, how we had quantum centric supercomputing, my prediction is in the next couple of years the level of abstraction is even going to go higher, where we, we can I, imagine uh, you just start using uh, some type of software and you say run me a chemistry problem. There's a lot of science, of course, to still be done, a lot of engineering to be done, but we've got these more mature APIs now. So it's starting now. So you made a, a lot of huge announcements today. I mean, we learned more about details of scaling. Uh, we you know, introduced this uh, new class of computing called quantum centric supercomputing. Uh, APIs, but there's even more. <laughs> As I look at the press release, I mean, you brought out uh, tons. What are some other Quantum Summit highlights that you want to make sure uh, people uh, tune into? Yeah, we didn't even uh, have time to touch on the um, the two announcements which confirm our roadmap. So I'm very, very happy that we're uh, announcing the 433 Osprey, so the largest uh, quantum device that's made. We're also showing a second generation of it that we're actually managing, uh, measuring at the moment that even has improved performance. So not only have we made generation one, we've made generation two, and so uh, and we're working on making it better. We have enough in generation two measured too many of the qubits, but from the ones that we've measured, they, it looks like it's gonna be an improved Osprey. And then we've also released dynamic circuits. Those dynamic circuits, are available on 18 of our systems, essentially all the devices that can support uh, fast measurement. And so they, they're two points that we said we would release from our development roadmap we talked about before. And um, I'm happy to say we're gonna put two more tick boxes along on our, our progress. Then beyond that, um, we, we um, also made announcements in how error suppression can be integrated into the software how we're bringing a quantum safe announcement to the market and how um, more and more clients are working, uh, working with us. And then we're going to announce a challenge. It's gonna be hard. We are committing to that we will be able to run a certain size problem. We call it hundred qubits by hundred depth and give reliable results within a day. And so I'm hoping this challenge will, uh, will allow people doing the algorithmic work to say, well, how can I actually um, come up with a, with an algorithm that can fit on that device? So we want to we we feel confident with the progress in our performance that we combine this all together. That a hundred qubits running a hundred depth uh, and uh, getting reliable results could be done within a day. And our target is to demonstrate that by the end of 2024. 
So that's another uh, <laughs> announcement that we're going out on something that we think is important. Uh, as you said at the start, as we add more and more to it, it is difficult, but I'm hoping that with this announcement, we can start to get um, the research that's targeted to the algorithmic development to say what can be done in this size system. No, I love it. And it, this is a challenge for your developers, right? Using yes. uh, IBM technology. No, this is great. And, you know, leave it up to, you know, the engineers of the world. You, you put something in front of them, you know, some big contest, the, the ability to get notoriety and it just works. I mean, that's been the case for, yeah. I don't know, since science started, I guess. I, I don't know. But at least I know from the last 40 years of, of being in and around this uh, this business. Uh, so, Jay, I mean, I don't even know what to say. I mean, the amount of announcements are are incredible. Uh, you know, when the announcements can't fit on a single piece of paper, uh, you're bringing out a lot. But, you know, this problem is so complex at so many different levels. And IBM is not just taking this at the, you know, hey, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to stay and, you know, do this tiny piece of silicon or one piece of the problem, because this is a, it's a systemic problem, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's about every step in the entire value chain. And one way that, that I view your approach is different as it's a system wide view of the problem. It's not just software, it's hardware. Uh, it's not just IBM, you're working with other people on it. It's not just about, this, you know, either a, a, a tiny trap or a tiny piece of silicon, uh, you're looking at the scaling of the system and, oh, by the way, the interconnects to get there. So from our analyst point of view, we saw we see a lot of companies taking certain bites of the problem, but very few. OK, maybe one uh, taking <laughs> taking the holistic uh, part of it. And that makes your job and your uh, scientists, I'm sure very, very, uh, busy people. Well, that is definitely true, but I think one thing we will get with the concept of quantum centric supercomputing is now I think we can articulate some research challenges. I would love to see someone come up with more cheaper, higher dense, uh, flex lines. Like one of the things we'll show in, a, show in the announcement is a 70% improvement in that density. So you don't have to have our scientists go in there and tighten every one of those lines. Uh, that, that, that's just not long-term uh, uh, possible for health reasons to make that many lines tighten and, and connect it. And, but there's nothing that stops us making this much more dense. So I think as we go forward, there will be lots more collaboration and I think this will allow us to even accelerate faster to very large systems. And so I'm looking for a future where we are not scared of hundreds of thousands of qubits. And so how do we get, how do we make sure that we've got the, the software, the controls, the applications that can use this? And I think this is a, this is a great challenge for us and, and I, I'm looking forward to it. It's great. So, Jay, uh, congratulations to you and your team on a huge day today. Uh, we're going to bring this to a close. I could sit here and talk to you for hours. Oh, imagine that I, I actually did. We did talk for hours uh, when uh, when we met last time. But this is the More Insights and Strategy podcast show, and uh, we have to come to an end. So thanks so much for coming on. This thanks. is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy and Dr. Jay Gambetta. Uh, IBM's fellow and VP of IBM Quantum. We hope you like what you heard. Give us some comments on Twitter or any other social media of your choice. We're on there and hit that subscribe button. So with that, I'm going to take us out. Have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're tuning in from.